Good morning, viewers, subscribers, Kingdom Saints. This morning, we're going to learn how to effectively teach the Mormons the error of their ways because they are another of a cult <coughs> which is preaching the wrong doctrines to all these poor lost souls out here and leading them astray, actually leading them to damnation. We can't allow that as Christians, can we? I'm going to list what they believe in and I'm going to also list Bible verse and scripture to counter their man-made beliefs. I'm not going to list their Bible passages because they don't have a Bible. They have their own manipulated, malignant Bible called the Book of Mormons, which is not God's word. So we go with God's word, not his word, her word, or their word. Only the one and only true eternal God's word. Amen. So let's start with what they believe in and scriptures that prove they're wrong. They say the Bible has been corrupted by errors of translation and transmission as well as by deliberate action. That's what they say but God says the words of God and Jesus cannot wither, fade, fall or pass away thus the Bible, the word of God cannot be corrupted let's go to Isaiah 40 verse 8 Isaiah 40 verse 8 the grass withered, the flower faded, but the word of our God shall stand forever. The word of our God shall stand. How long? Forever. How long? Forever. Let's go to Matthew twenty four thirty five. Matthew twenty four thirty five. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. My words shall not pass away. Hold on, we got two more. Let's go to Luke twenty one thirty three. Luke 21, 33, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Okay, the last one is 1 Peter 1, 23, 25. Let's go there, shall we? 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the word of God, which live it and abide it forever. Good stuff. Okay, what else do they believe? They believe the church. They say that the true church was lost and needed restoring. The true church was lost and needed restoring. God is the one who does the restoring, not mankind. God says the true church is unshakable, indestructible, bringing glory to Christ in all ages. Woo! How could they mislook that? How could they? Let's go to Isaiah 51, 6, 8. Isaiah 51, 6. 
Lift up your eyes to the heaven and look upon the earth beneath. For the heaven shall vanish away like smoke and the earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revilings. For the mart shall eat them up like a garment, and the worn shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. You're going to hear the gavel in front of the judge in a minute. There. Case closed. Eh? <laughs> Let's go to Hebrews 10.23. Hebrews 10.23. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. He is faithful that promised. Since the covenant, since the promises in the Old Testament, the covenant, that's how long God's word has been going strong without wavering without wavering so then let's move on to the next one shall we the secret appearance they say Jesus Christ and the Heavenly Father appeared in secret to Joseph, Joseph Smith in the woods. Really? Wow, I didn't see that in scriptures. I didn't even know there was an American in scriptures. No, I'm just playing. Joseph Smith is their founder, their leader. That's who they follow. Joseph Smith, yes, a man. A man. That's what they say. But God says, since his coming would be obvious to all, Jesus warned us not to believe those who claim to see him in secret. Let's go to Zechariah 14, four. Zechariah 14, four. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of La Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall be moved toward the north and half of it toward the south. Next one is Matthew 24, 23 to 27. Let's go there, shall we? Matthew 24, 23 to 27. Let's start at 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall, sh and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. 
For as the lightning coming out of the east and shine it even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay. We just disproved their fallacy. We just disproved their fallacy. Let's go to Revelation 1 7. Let's go to Revelation 1 7. Revelation 1 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so. Amen. Amen, amen. Okay, moving on to the next fallacy. The nature of God. This is what they say about the nature of God. God, our Heavenly Father, is an exalted man of flesh and bone. Hmm? What you talking about, Willis? Really? An exalted man of flesh and bone. We're going to prove them wrong here. God is a spirit able to dwell in men. God is a spirit able to dwell in men. Let's go to Matthew 16, 17, shall we? Matthew 16, 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood had not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Doesn't sound like a man with flesh and bone to me. Because the last time I checked, God is seated on his throne in heaven. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Eh? Let's go to John 4, verse 24. I hope you guys are taking notes. John 4, 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. All these passages, scriptures, which is God's word, will, will be beneficial for everyone who deals with Mormons to disprove their theological beliefs and to bring them to the truth of Jesus and to convert them to Christianity. Amen. Okay, that was John 24. Let's go to John 14. John 14, 23. John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He's talking about his father in heaven. So if the Mormons believe that God is man made of flesh, who is Jesus talking about here? Because it's only him and the disciples. Who was he? I don't think God was amongst the disciples. So, we just proved that fallacy wrong. Jesus was a, amongst the disciples, the Son of God, but God the Father was seated on his throne in heaven, looking down at his son, saying, 
This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Even the disciples heard that at the transformation. Am I right about it? Okay, you Mormons. You're about to pack up your stuff into your camping bag and your backpack and hit the trail. Okay, what else do they believe? The nature between the father and the son. They say our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, the Son, are two distinct physical beings. Yes, they don't believe in the Trinity and the deity of God. They don't believe in none of that, just like the, the Jehovah's Witnesses. So, we'll see what God says about this. God says the Father and the Son are distinct persons, yet are one God. We can find this in Isaiah 9, verse 6. Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Well, doesn't sound to me like God the Father. Doesn't sound to me like God the Father. Sounds to me like God the Son. Well, Come on, really, where do they get these, these ideas from? Oh yeah, Joseph Smith, but where did he get these ideas from? Oh yeah, the synagogue of Satan. Let's go to John five seventeen. John five seventeen. But Jesus answered them, my father work it hither too, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. There you go. There you go. And we're going to seal it with this. John 14, 9, 10, and 11. John 14, 9, 10, and 11. John 14, 9, 10, and 11. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that had seen me had seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am the Father. I am in the Father, and the Father in me or else believe me for the very work's sake. There you go. There you go. Case closed. Case closed. Okay, what other fallacies that do they believe? The Holy Spirit. Very good, the Holy Spirit. They say the Holy Ghost is a third distinct spirit being, different also in function 
an identity from the Holy Spirit. They say that the Holy Ghost is different in function and identity from the Holy Spirit. So that sounds like an evil spirit that they're worshiping. Because there's only one Holy Ghost. There's only one Holy Spirit. Only one. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's nothing else. Let's see what God says about this matter. God says the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit are two names for one being, the same being. Which is also one of the three persons of the one triune God. Let's go to Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. And he said, go and tell this people, he indeed, but understand not, and see indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Now let's go to Acts 5, 3, 4. Acts 5, 3 and 4. But Peter said, Ananias, why had Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Well, how it remained? Was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Here he mentions in 5.3 that he lied to the Holy Ghost. And here in 5.4 it says that he lied not unto men, but unto God. Two distinct, but one triune God. Well, okay, what else is left for us to examine and dissect and break the atoms down and feed it to them for spiritual nutrition? Oh yes, the nature of Christ. This is going to be very interesting. Pay attention. They say, we're talking about the nature of Christ. This is what they say. They say that Jesus is the little son of God, conceived as we were, but of an immortal father. I am so glad that God has given us his true word to live on and not these fallacies that these courts are mislead, are following and misleading other people, which is why we must come to their rescue and bring them out of the darkness that they're in right now. They say that Jesus is a little son of God conceived as we were really, but of an immortal father. That means that Jesus Christ was a mere human and God is a father who is not everlasting. You know what? That sounds like blasphemy. 
which is the unpardonable sin. Let's see what God says. God says, Jesus himself uncreated, created all things physical and spiritual before creating man upon the earth. Okay, I think the fallacy was just bought up and flying in the wind. Let's go to Isaiah 45, verse 12, shall we? Isaiah 45, verse 12. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their host have I commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city, and he shall let go my captives, not for price nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Let's go to John 1. Verse 1 and 2. John 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. The same was in the beginning with God. The same is Jesus. So... Their nature, their view of the nature of Christ is 100 times 100 times 100 times 1,000 times 1,000 percent wrong. See, this is what happens when man strays from God and creates these fallacies and calls it God's word. But it really is not God's word, and we're proving it right now. And this is these are the uh, scriptures that you need to to have in you. Even if you have to write it down and keep it in your back pocket. Every time you see a Mormon. But be nice about it, you know. Just go over scriptures, talk about Jesus, ask them stuff like like this here, and then correct them. Rebuke them as well, but in a gentle, lovingly kind of way. Okay, what is another one of their fallacies? Oh, here's a good one. Jesus and Lucifer. This is what they say. They say that Jesus is mankind's Elder brother. <laughs> and he is the firstborn spirit child of our Heavenly Father. <laughs> and by inference, he is the spirit brother to Lucifer and his demons. This is why they need to be taught. Bible scriptures and the truth of Jesus because just about everything that they believe is a blasphemy against the Lord and against the Holy Spirit. Let's see what God says about this matter. God does not change and has never been anything other than who he is now. He has never ever been a man. Let's go to Numbers 23 19, shall we? Numbers 23 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the Son of Man that he should repent. Had he said, 
and shall he not do it? Or had he spoken? And shall he not make it good? They're gonna they're gonna look at you like give me more, give me more scriptures because this is the truth. And the truth will set them free. Let's go to 1 Samuel 15, 29. 1 Samuel 15, 29. 1 Samuel 15, 29. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. So we're going to nail this down with one more nail. We're going to nail it down. Romans 1, 21 and 23. 21 through 23. Romans 1, 21. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. There. That just ended that. God has spoken. Let the church say amen. What is their next fallacy that they believe in? Salvation. This is what they say about salvation. One's personal salvation and exaltation is conditioned upon his works and obedience to the teachings of the Mormon church, with the highest exaltation going to those who are most faithful. Mm, mm, mm. That is just a complete misdiagnosis of God's word. Conditioned upon his works. For we are saved by grace through faith, not of our own works, so that no one may boast. This is what God says. Only those who trust in Christ will gain entrance into heaven. But almost doesn't count here. All others will be cast into the lake of fire as a result of trusting in their own good works. You can find this in John 14, 6. Jesus, John 14, 6. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And this is where we are saved by grace through faith because Jesus is the grace. Jesus is the grace. Grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. That is grace. And he gives us the grace. He gives us his grace. Let's see there, boy. What's the next one there, there boy? Galatians 2.16. Let's go there, shall we? Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, 
but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And I want to add, Jesus said, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So those who have faith in Jesus, he has already done everything at the cross for us because he is the lamb slain who overcame and is coming back once again to reclaim the kingdom of heaven. Amen, amen. Let all the saints and the church say amen. Amen. Yeah. Let's go to Galatians 21. Galatians 2, 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If righteousness come, we couldn't keep the law. We could not keep the law. This is why God was made manifest in the flesh to give us one last chance because we could not keep the Mosaic laws. Do you know that the Ten Commandments was only ten of the commandments of the law? The total number of the law was 613. There is no way that the Israelites could keep the law. There's no way. That's why Jesus was a lamb slain, the perfect man on earth who set an example for all of us. The only man on earth who never ever sinned to give us his grace because it takes grace to do what the lamb slain did, what Jesus did. It takes grace, and he has so much grace. He's given it out to all of us so that we, we, you, me, can be saved because by grace we are saved through faith not of our own works. Works means nothing. Works means nothing. You can't work to earn God's grace. You can't buy God's grace. No matter how much money you make, that means nothing. No matter what you do in this life, that means nothing un unless you're following Jesus and you put all your faith and all your trust in him. Amen. For he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that we might have the righteousness of God in him. In him. Amen. Let's go to Revelation 20 4 through 6. Revelation 20, 4 through 6. And I saw thrones, and they, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived in and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. 
blessed and holy is he that had part in the first resurrection. On such the second death had no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Amen. So in this case, the highest exaltation goes to God. He gets all the glory. God does not share his glory with anyone. God does not share his glory with anyone. Amen. Okay, that's it. They are in serious need of ministering and of teaching. You know, I encountered a Mormon before, and I invited him to a Bible study. And at first he sounded interested. Then he went back to his friends and he said, well, I won't be able to do it. So if I can get one of them by themselves, because I believe when he went back, they told him no. Because he came back and told me no, but he said yes at first after, before he went to see his friends. Uh, so uh, I'm not saying that they can't be converted. And I'm not saying that they have, that, that their hearts are hardened. But you just got to get them at the right time or, or maybe one who, who is more, more susceptible to the true word and wants to follow God, the real God, not their God or gods, but really wants to be converted to Christianity, wants it in his heart, you might get lucky there. But most of them travel in packs. I never seen one by himself. So anyway, let me uh, give you some tips here. Don't engage Mormons in verbal battle. Pray first, be led by the Holy Spirit, then share the scriptures with them verse by verse. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Never forget who you are in Christ. Set apart Christ as Lord and always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and do this with respect. Do this with gentleness and respect. Amen. And define your faith with the word. All scripture is God breathed and is useful to, for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Second Timothy three sixteen. Thank you for watching. Y'all have a blessed day.